Let's take a moment just to come to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we open your word to us this morning, we know that it's a living word and that speaks truth to us today. Truth that we can embrace for our lives in our journey with you and our journey with following Jesus. And so we would pray that your spirit would make your words alive for us again this morning as we turn to you in Jesus name. Amen. Well, some of you may have noticed that Lois and I were missing last week. We weren't playing hooky. We actually tried to zoom in. Um, we had gone up north to visit our granddaughter who was turning eight. And, um, and she gave us, a, well, she gave Lois a gift back, and that was a cold that she had. So Lois is at home, and she's zooming, so I'll, I'll wave. Um, and you all could wave, too. She won't see you, but you could wave, too. And, but she brings her greetings to you. So let's begin this morning just by recapping briefly about what's already happened at the beginning of this chapter. Because this chapter really is, there's lots that goes on. But the real theme of what uh, Luke is writing about is this transition. This transition that's taking place that's going to take the gospel out of a Jewish Jerusalem-centered milieu to the Gentiles. And so our passage today is just a little glimpse into this journey that Jesus is taking the church on, that the Holy Spirit is taking the church on. And so if we think back to the beginning of the chapter, it was Saul who was out trying to arrest all of the believers. And he had been given authority from the chief priests to go from Jerusalem up to Damascus and to search out believers and arrest them. But along the way, Jesus interrupts his journey. And as a result of meeting the Lord on the road to Damascus, he's blinded and led by hand into Damascus. And God calls a disciple in Damascus named Ananias to go where Saul is staying and to lay hands on him to restore his sight. Now, the initial response to, from Ananias is that he balks at this idea. He goes like, Lord, don't you know who this guy is and what he's been doing? But God makes it really clear that this is what and why he has to do. He says, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And this is the key verse for everything that's going to follow in the next few chapters. Ananias does obediently go and does what God instructed and immediately Saul's sight is restored and he's filled with the Holy Spirit and is baptized and then takes some food to restore his strength because he hadn't eaten for the three days that he had been in Damascus. Now, the record of Acts gives us this impression that things happen really quickly. But as we learned um, two weeks ago, and really from Paul's own account in Galatians 1, that after this happens, he goes for some time into Arabia. And I, and I think that that time was set alone for him to hear from God and understand this transition that needed to take place in his thinking of who Jesus really was. Because then he could come back and share that message and speak about it. So there was this time. And then when we also find out that while he's in Damascus, he's there for three years preaching the gospel to people. And it takes three years before the opposition becomes so intense in their hatred of him and what he was doing that they're threatening to kill him. So his friends sneak him out of the city by lowering him over the wall. Now think, if you go to look at a map, Damascus isn't that far from Jerusalem. 
And when Saul goes to Jerusalem, what happens? The apostles that are there, the disciples that are there, don't want to have anything to do with him. They're afraid of him. They think he's a fake. They don't think that he's a true believer, a real disciple. Didn't they hear what was going on in Damascus for three years? Didn't they hear about him preaching the gospel in the synagogues and to people? Had had they missed what was going on just that short distance away? They were fearful. And it takes Barnabas. We've We've heard about Barnabas. Do you remember where we heard about Barnabas? End of chapter 4. He was a man that sold a field and gave the money to the apostles. That's what we learned about Barnabas. He was a man that was living out his faith in that community and obedience to God. So he brokers a relationship for Saul to be invited into meeting with the apostles and being part of that fellowship in Jerusalem. And it says that he was there for a short time, but if we go back to Galatians again, uh, Paul shares that he was with Peter for 15 days. Just 15 days. So while it took him three years to tick off everybody in Damascus, it only took him 15 days before they were so up in arms with what he was preaching that they wanted to kill him there. And so we go on and we read that uh, the believers kind of hustled him out of the city and they they put him on the first boat leaving the area. They they took him to the coast and put him on a boat and and they sent him from Caesarea off to Tarsus. And it doesn't, think, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of forethought to this. You know, he just, we're getting him on the first boat out of town, right? It's like, as quickly as we can. But then we realize that where they sent him was to his hometown. His tom- hometown in Asia. In a land of the Gentiles. Which is now modern, a piece of modern Turkey. And so here... When we think of what God had said to Ananias on the road, he's my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. And that's the community that he went back to. The place where he had grown up, where he was aware of the culture. And it would be 14 years, 14 years before he returned to Jerusalem again. The last verse before we pick up our text today makes it clear that the dynamics for the life of the church after Paul was gone and through that period where the persecution seemed to decrease, the church grew and the life of the believers was changed, the dynamics of it. In verse 31, it said, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace a time of peace, and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. God was doing a work. But now Luke returns his focus back to Peter because Saul's now off in Tarsus. And in the period of persecution, we had seen earlier that, uh, you know, when Saul was going around and arresting believers, um, the church had scattered. They'd gone, Philip had gone to Samaria, and Peter and John had gone to Samaria just to confirm what was going on. And when they saw that, that what they were believing, and the Holy Spirit came upon them just like they had on the Jews in Jerusalem, they returned home to Jerusalem. And now as we're picking up the scriptures with verse 32... Um, In this time of peace, it seems that Peter's ready to travel again. He's ready to go on a journey, but it's more to encourage the growing church in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. 
And in this part of Peter's journey as a follower of Jesus, he is going to be stretched. Stretched beyond his comfort zone. And God is going to help him grow in his understanding of the kingdom. And so today we join Peter on this road trip. So if you hadn't planned on it, we're going on a road trip today. Where he visits a couple of different cities, engages with three very specific people, and he sees God work in him and through him in powerful, miraculous ways. All of it preparing him for the next big challenge God will place before him. And what he experiences in these situations are initial exposures to God extending the kingdom to the Gentiles. Not just through Saul, Paul, but also through him. And we'll see that the implications of his connections with these people, there's both personal, community, and then implications for Peter himself. So the first place he ends up going is Lydda. In verse 32 it reads, As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas. That's how I think we'll say it. We'll try and do, I wanted to just call him Albert. You know, it would have been simpler, but Aeneas, uh, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And immediately Aeneas got up, and all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon, another town close by, saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, I envision that Peter is heading off not on an evangelistic crusade, but on a a visit to churches to strengthen them, to help them uh, in, in what they're doing. He's going off to the existing church in Lydda. And this city isn't too far from Jerusalem. It's about 25 miles northwest. And we're in Kitchener-Waterloo, so you really never know what direction to point when you're saying northwest because it's so confusing. But it's, it's over here somewhere. But it was at the intersection of two main roads. The road from Jerusalem to Joppa, which is the closest port on the Mediterranean. And so a lot of traffic went in and out along that road between Jerusalem and Joppa and the rest of the world. But it was also the major road that ran up from Egypt to Syria. And so it was a busy place. It was a place of commerce. And it principally was a Jewish town, but with a a lot of mixtures of Gentiles as well that lived there because of the business aspects of what was going on. And what's recorded here is not the activity that Peter had set out to be engaged in, but rather I see it as an interruption to his schedule, to his agenda. Sometimes that happens, right? We go on a road trip and we have a plan. We're going to be place A on this day, place B on that day. And Sarah and Bryant just got back from a trip to uh, England and Scotland for a week and a half. And, you know, they had their journey all mapped out. They had the Airbnbs they were staying in. They had all the sites that they wanted to see around it. And everything worked out great until their flight coming home got delayed by two hours. And I got waiting at the airport for all of that extra time. <laughs> but that happens, right? We get interrupted in journeys and in our plans. And I, and I see this situation as something that's really interrupted Peter in the midst of what he was attempting to do in visiting the churches. Now, there's no indication that Aeneas was a believer or part of the existing church. His his name is a classic Greek name, not Jewish. And the idea that Peter found him, to me, reflects this idea of this encounter being unplanned. And since he was paralyzed and bedridden for the past eight years, it it may have been possible that it was a, a group of believers that were caring for him and had included him in the life of the church. 
The fact is we really don't know all the details, but what we do know is that Peter, in a manner very reminiscent of Jesus, informs Aeneas that Jesus has healed him and he should pick up his mat and walk. Doesn't that sound familiar? And although Peter had experience with a lame person needing healing, if we go back to the beginning of Acts and at the, at the gate to the temple, rather than taking Aeneas by the hand and helping him to his feet, he just spoke to him and didn't touch him. And I think that perhaps this reflected the discomfort he was experiencing with the fact that Aeneas was a Gentile. Jews weren't supposed to associate with Gentiles. And he had gone to support the church. And yet he's been thrown into this situation with this Gentile man. Now, the witness of this event in his life becomes widely known to people in Lydda and the wider area of Sharon, and as a result, many more people come to faith. God uses this miraculous healing to bring people to faith. But what we see is the focus really in in this narrative isn't really around the miracle. It's, it, the kingdom is expanding geographically and it's expanding culturally. But Peter himself is being stretched by his experience of journeying with Jesus and being interrupted in this town of Lydda. Now, the story shifts to another town and another person. And it isn't a question of Peter finding someone, but rather a group of people finding Peter and dragging him into their situation, which has a a real sense of urgency. Now, Joppa was that port city down the road 10 miles from, from Lydda. So it was even closer than Jerusalem to Lydda. And so it's not surprising that the news that Peter was there and that Ananias had had this remarkable healing, that the news of that had reached to this community. And they were uh, aware of Peter being relatively close by. In verse 36, we read, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is an Aramaic name, which was kind of the language of the common culture in that area of the world. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. And about that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. They put her on ice, so to speak. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once, it tells us. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. And all the widows, not the windows, although they probably had some windows in the room too, but all the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Now, some of the things we learn about Tabitha or Dorcas are are much clearer than what we knew about Ananias. First off, she is a believer. She is part of that faith community that he's gone to engage with. She was involved in the local church body in Joppa. And she was also consistent in living out her faith in service to others. She was always doing good and helping the poor, it tells us, and seemed to have a particularly effective ministry to the widows in the community. And it certainly appears that she was quite the seamstress, making robes and other clothing. 
I don't know who saw the CTV news last night and the little clip about made here. If you don't go home and get on your computer, and I'm sure little probably, uh, Tabitha Dorcas looked a little different than the lady that they're, you know, highlighted on the making things here. And I think that if she had lived in Lydda, I could very much imagine that she may have been one of the believers that provided care and support for Ananias. That was who she was. That was her heart of following Jesus and serving. Now, as a port city, Joppa had a much larger Gentile community and Greek community. And the, and the passage gives us both her Aramaic name and Tabitha and her Greek name, Dorcas. And most commentaries suggest she was a Greek Gentile, very much like Aeneas, living in the community, but she had, you know, become part of the church. She'd come to faith. And she's part of this church community with other believers that are probably most likely predominantly Jewish and from a Jewish tradition. And what's important is the use of both names is consistent with the greater theme that's developing that this is a movement towards the church opening up to the Gentile world. Now Dorcas becomes sick. And as a result of her illness, which all seems to happen quite suddenly, uh, she dies. And they begin the process of grieving and preparing her body for burial. Uh, But burial was supposed to take place, when you read the scriptures, on the same day that somebody died. That's what they did. That's the tradition. You don't wash them and then leave them on... They didn't leave them on ice because I doubt they had ice at the time, but you don't put them in an upstairs room for a viewing. So very untraditional. And it's that they, they were knowledge that Peter was close by and their knowledge of what had happened in... Lydda encouraged them to send a delegation of two people to try and get Peter to come. And it's really not that far a stretch, right? If you can heal somebody who's been lame for eight years, certainly you can bring somebody back from the dead. Pastor, would you mind dropping by to visit us tomorrow? Our neighbors kind of died and we'd like you to raise them from the dead. Talk about high expectations for a pastor. But that's, that's really what happened here. And Peter hears from the widows. And he gets presented with this evidence of why it would be a good idea to bring her back to life. Right? Like if anyone deserves to come back from the dead, she does. Right? She's been faithfully living out and serving the poor and us widows, and look at all this beautiful stuff she can make, and certainly if anyone deserves to be brought back from the dead, it's her. And this is where verse 40 picks up, when Peter has come to them and gone up to the room. said, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. And then he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. And then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. And this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Now, I'm a visual person, and I try to think of Really, what's going on in that room? And, you know, Peter's up there with them, and he essentially opens the door and kicks everybody out. You have to leave now. And the door closes, and he's left alone with this dead body. I'm trying to think of what I would be thinking. 
Good Lord, get me out of this place. What am I supposed to do here? I shouldn't even be close to a dead body. It makes me ceremonially unclean. What's going to happen? All these people are expecting something, and, and I'm here. So I envision I can't get down on my knees because one's crappy. Um, but imagine that Peter gets down at that door and go, puts his head on it like this, and off his knees just starts to pray, and probably confessing all of his uncertainty. But the beautiful thing in prayer is we bring things to God. He listens and he answers. And at some point, God inspires him to trust him. And he gets up off his knees, and he turns from the door of escape to the woman's lying there and tells her, Tabitha, get up. And she opens her eyes. He may have wanted to bolt through the door at that point, too, because, like, whoa, whoa this, this is working. And he goes over, and she sits up, and then he takes her by the hand and helps her to her feet. Now, I think for a lot of the people that left and were on the other side of the door, they were kind of standing there expecting that, you know, Peter's going to show up walking through the door by himself. We're asking a lot of God here. I'm not sure God's going to do this. But instead, he stands there with her and invites them back in. Can you imagine being one of those widows or one of those people that walk through that door into that room and see your dear friend who you had left for dead days ago standing there? Think of the excitement. Think of the party that would break out with that happening. So it's, it's not surprising that the news of that miracle spreads. And this woman goes back to her sewing and making things and serving and helping the poor and the widows. And I'm sure people would come for miles to see her, to see the miracle that God had performed. But again... The story's not really about the miracle. At least in her life. The main theme of the story is about the miracle that God is working in Peter's life. Stretching him. Taking him places where he doesn't think he should go. Getting out of his comfort zone. And our passage ends with one more verse that's simple comment, but it's significant. And, and when we look at it, it kind of goes, boy, there was so much in those first two encounters. Why this verse is included. And verse 43 says that Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Where's the miracle? Why, why, would, why would Luke bother to record that Peter went and where he stayed? Wow. The mention of Simon's trade here is really significant. The Jews considered tanning a disreputable business. To be constantly in contact with the bodies of dead animals caused ceremonial uncleanliness. In the same way that being engaged with Gentiles, the same way with being engaged with or touching a, a dead body. And so the fact that Peter lived with Simon showed he was no longer bound by this rule that he had lived with. And we wonder where the miracle is in this, but you know, I think there may be two miracles that take place here. There's this miracle of Simon, uh, of Peter being stretched by God. 
But I also think that this was a miracle for Simon the Tanner. And I was thinking that, isn't this somewhat reminiscent of Jesus going to the home of Zacchaeus? The tax collector, right? The sinner. You're not supposed to associate with those people. You're breaking the code of the status quo of not associating with sinners. And maybe the healing was in the life of Simon the Tanner, who may have felt like an outcast in his own community because of the work that he did. Maybe this changed his life as much as the lives of Aeneas and Dorcas had been changed. And in a not-so-subtle way, it shows another dimension of how God was stretching Peter and his faith and opening him up to receive the vision God gives him in the next chapter, where this journey continues. So while our attention may be drawn to the miraculous power of God at work in the healing of Aeneas and the resurrection of Dorcas, and the ensuing response of faith from such wide areas of the community. The real theme and message of this passage is on Peter and the changes God was making in him. How God was stretching him beyond, beyond some of the cultural baggage that he carried around about how God worked and opening him up to the new things that God wanted to accomplish. And let's just think a little bit more about who Peter was and what we have seen of his life journey as a follower of Jesus. Peter was not a sophisticated man. He wasn't a man of learning. He hadn't spent his younger years at the foot of a rabbi. That, that's what surprised the Sanhedrin when him and John were brought before them. Aren't these just fishermen? Aren't, aren't these unlearned men? And yet they could speak on behalf of Jesus and challenge them. He was a blue-collar worker, just like his father before him, a, a fisherman. But he was Jewish and grew up in a Jewish community, so he had learned to live his life aligned with the cultural standards of that world that religion, that nation. And so, although he was not a real student of the Torah, he had absorbed the, you do this, you don't do that. Now, I grew up in the age where, you know, if you were a good Baptist, you didn't, you know, dance, you didn't smoke, you didn't drink. Really. You know, like those weren't in the scriptures, but you knew the rules, right? And it's, it's that kind of thing that he had grown up with. And so he was brought that baggage into his relationship with Jesus, with his journey. When Jesus said to him, follow me, and I will make you fish for men. Peter brought all that baggage along with him as he started his journey with Jesus. And throughout the Gospels, we see this play out from moments of real insight into who Jesus was and Moments of real faith to completely missing the point sometimes when Jesus was trying to say something or show them something and then what he was teaching. And ultimately to even eventually denying that he even knew Jesus. Talk about an up and down journey. Like if we follow Peter's life through the Gospels and even we'll see he'll still have some of this moving through Acts. There's this real up and down piece to his life. Yet after Pentecost, Peter becomes the spokesman and leader of the church. But God still isn't finished with continuing to shape and help him grow in following Jesus. And we'll see that Peter still has many things to learn as we continue in our study of the book of Acts. He, he'll get some things right and get some things wrong. So we see that he carried this baggage of 
you know, the laws of not associating with a Gentile, with associating with a dead body or touching a dead body or associating with dead animals, that all of those things contributed to being ceremonially unclean. Those are something, some things he never would have done up until this point of time in his journey with Jesus. He would have been uncomfortable and would do everything within his own power to avoid being found in any of these situations. But God was using these situations to prepare him and nudge him to being ready to respond when God comes to him in a vision. So what does God have to say to us today about our journey with Jesus? I think there's a personal response that we have to explore. And it's a simple question. Have you responded to Jesus' call to follow him? Have you responded to Jesus' call to follow him? Have you started your journey in life learning to trust Jesus with every part of your life? There is a saying that every journey starts with a single step. And Jesus calls us all to take that first step into relationship with him. Begin that journey. And for those of us that have been on this journey with Jesus for some time, a good question to ask ourselves is, have we burdened ourselves with so much baggage of how we, we really know how God works? We've got it figured out. We're comfortable with our relationship with Jesus. We, we know who he is, and we know that he loves us, and I'm kind of happy with the way life is right now. And we've gathered some baggage along the way that we're just, that's us and him. And we can't see God doing anything different. We just can't get beyond ourselves to see what God could be doing or might be calling us to. Question for us is, are we willing to be stretched? Are we willing to trust Jesus to open us up to new challenges, to new opportunities, to follow him to new places and to new relationships in the ways that he wants to show us? Each of us has to be asking ourselves those questions. Where am I in my journey with Jesus? And have I closed him off from doing something new. Collectively, we've joined together on this journey as Grace and Radiant City Churches. We've, we've been at this for uh, well over two years when I first talked to Gord. We've been meeting since September. We've been on this journey together as churches. And as Grace, we bring over 20 years of collective baggage of this is the way we worship. This is the, what we think church has been like. This is how we operate as a church. But as Radiant, we bring over 10 years of collective baggage as well. This is the way we do it. This is how we worship. This is how we live out our faith. But Jesus has invited us into a new journey together. And my prayer really is that we may both be willing to follow the example of Peter and be willing to allow God to stretch us, to grow us, to challenge us, to renew us. And my prayer is that he'll do a powerful work within us so that the news of what God has done here and with us will reach out to our community and bring many people into a journey of following Jesus alongside us. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that your spirit has called us into this journey to seek you, to seek your will, to understand what you would have us do as we move forward 
in following you. And Lord, some of those ways are uncertain. Some of those ways we will find challenging, but above all, Lord, might we see Jesus. Might your spirit help us to see his heart for us, for our community, and for the world. Amen.